Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of the Overcast Podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Wes. And today we are incredibly grateful to be joined by Mr. Castleface Records himself, Matt Jones. How are you doing, Matt? Oh, I'm okay. How about you guys? <laughs> doing fine. Pretty good. Uh, banged up my face last night. Oh no, what'd you do? Um, so last night was a Saturday night for the boys. All right. Got drunk, barbecued. Um, I think when I was asleep, I had a gnarly dream. Mm-hmm. And I hit my face on my uh, my nightstand. Wow, night terror. <laughs> yeah, I didn't wake up though. So wow, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. He has the the scars to prove that it actually happened. So yeah, my, fa- <laughs> my face is all fucked right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we cool. still you made it. Cool, He's like, you I'm, got I'm, a cool I'm, filter, so it's like you know nobody really blocks it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> Where his scars are, you kind of you can see a castle face behind it, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, how how have you been holding up? Uh, times times are getting there; they're getting better. But uh, how how have you been trucking through all this? Yeah, uh, you know it's crazy. I kind of t- I took like two weeks off in March, <laughs> and I've been like, super busy ever since. So like. I was like, oh, my God, the world is, like, falling apart. Like, what do I do? And then I went back to work and realized, oh, I have, like, 300 orders to ship. That's what I got to do. And so the Mm -hmm. amount of it gone since then. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm a bit of a shut-in these days. And um, I've had so much stuff to do that really the only – I mean, there's, there's obviously been, like, you know, the world happening and, like, times happening and stuff. But – I mean, the biggest d- disruption uh, to to my generalized world is just finding out that record production record production just jumped out from like a month out to like four months out. So I was planning on sort of taking this summer pretty easy anyway, and now I like literally have to take this summer <laughs> easy. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I'm doing yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, the vinyl production thing is actually something we're gonna we'd like to talk up uh, talk about a little sure. later. Um, yeah. But first, we'd like to start from the beginning. Um, um, how did what? So Castleface holds a very special place in both of our hearts, I'm sure. But uh, with mine especially, because the first record I've ever bought on my own was from Castleface, and ever <laughs> ever since then, it's it's been a nonstop. Which it was the clear with black smoke King Gizzard. Uh, I'm in your mind fuzz. All right, cool. And that was it. And then I became obsessed with buying everything that you've put out since, essentially. Nice. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so how did what 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 was the inception of the idea of starting Castleface Records? Well, I can't say it was my idea. Uh, John had the idea first, and John and Brian Lee Hughes. Uh, basically, around the same time that I met John and Brian Lee Hughes. Um, they were starting a label to put out Sucks Blood mm-hmm. because John had dealt with some of the sort of mid-level indies and didn't like the way that they did things. He he was like, what? I You know, you can't own that forever. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. So his idea to start a record label, fantastic. Um, and basically right around that time, like I met him at a party. We started talking about one thing or another thing. And I was like, yeah, you know, I work in vinyl production. I would worked for Pirates Press for a couple of years at that point. Nice. And I was like, you know, if you want help putting that together, I'd be totally happy to help you. Like, I help do the layout. I help with the production. And just generally, I was just like, yeah, dude, I'm happy to, happy to jump in. And uh, after a couple of years of, you know, just sort of like, get in where you fit in sort of stuff. Like I helped Ty with the layout for his stuff. We scanned it on my like mom's old scanner, you know, that I inherited. (laughs) Classic. You know, like a little, uh, you know, he was like drawing and pen and like, you know, laying the stuff on the, on the scanner bed and stuff like that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of generally helping out. Um, They were like, we want to bring you onto the label. I was like, awesome. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. And I've been, keeping myself busy pretty much ever since that's really cool i didn't i had no idea that you were in vinyl production for uh before going into castle face oh very nice nice. pirates press logo yeah well you know they're punks and then (laughs) yeah 
the uh, person that came up with the logo was a tattoo artist that came by the office and, uh, you know, it's what the boys were doing. <laughs> uh, you know. Cool. How did you, how did you get into that business? Um, it's kind of funny, actually. <laughs> I was, uh, I was living, I, I grew up in Santa Rosa, which is north of San Francisco. And I was working uh, telemarketing jobs. Uh, at the time, I was working for a telemarketer that uh, uh, sold wine, and you could basically you'd sell it to businesses, and they'd put their logo on it and like send it to their good customers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I had just started seeing this girl in Berkeley, and um, I lied to my work. <laughs> I was like. Hey, I need the day off. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go look for a job, or I'm gonna go for a job interview in the city. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool, no big deal. And I basically just did it to hang out with this girl. <laughs> and <laughs> we were talking about it at breakfast the next morning. And her sister's boyfriend was like, "Oh my god, we need a salesman at my work. He'd be perfect." And that was for recordpressing.com. And then you know, a lot of the same people ended up at Pirates Press later on. It was sort of a mm-hmm dramatic thing but um that's basically how i got into it very nice that's really cool yeah um <laughs> lie to your lie to your work kids <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> get you far yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um one thing that i really love about castle face is all the of course all the bands on it and mm-hmm. all the different artists they're all just incredible like i said i've been buying essentially everything you put out since you know, since Orc, essentially, since around 2017. That's awesome. Um, and so I, I, I always thought, like, man, he, there's always this endless amount of talented people that are getting added to Castleface and stuff. So how, does, how do you go about scouting for bands and, you know, looking for artists to join Castleface? Well, you know, John does most of the A&R. Um, with, I, I, can, I can think of maybe, like, one or two exceptions. But for the most part... John touring around and playing mid-sized to large-sized clubs in cities all across the U.S. and across Europe and Australia. I mean, he basically gets to see, you know, the bands that are coming up. So he, he has a pretty great view on it. And, I mean, he's a voracious listener, a voracious consumer of movies, art, like everything. The guy is just, like, like insatiable so like you know every you know he's always looking for new stuff and he's always super critical i was worried that that was him <laughs> what are you talking about? uh you know he's he's like a critic at heart you know so he's like constantly talking about new stuff that he's heard new stuff that he's watched and all this and so you know basically that's that's kind of the that's kind of the way i mean there's a lot of stuff that I've enjoyed throughout the years that hasn't necessarily fit with the vision, which is fine. But I think, you know, really it is his singular, singular sort of vision as far as like, you know, what, what can, what can you still do to impress this dude? You know, he's been around. So yeah. it, I, I mean, I think that that's, I think that that's pretty valid, you know, <laughs> he's, mm-hmm. he's gotten to see all the bands pretty much. Yeah. Not all of them, but you know, there's a lot. You see a lot when you're on an OCs tour and you hear about a lot. Oh, what have you guys heard about lately? Like, he's constantly like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can totally see that, especially since when, when we saw the OCs for the first time, it was at Levitation in Austin. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were doing a two-nighter at the Barracuda RIP. Um, mm-hmm. And it was just... It was just a regular show the first night for Levitation. And then the second night was like a Castle Face show, which was, was like a bunch of... 2019, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just right there. I, I have the posters Can't and everything, yeah. Those were really good that year. That was a really good year. Yeah, that was a great show. And, like, I discovered a bunch of bands just isn't at that, that concert. Isn't that when we found uh, Holy Wave? Yeah, Holy yeah. Wave was a great one there. Uh, yeah. Amplified Heat was incredible. Amplified Heat, those guys are incredible. And yeah. uh, uh, Dream Decay played on that show. Pow played on that show. There was a lot of good stuff. Yeah, that that's one of the the core memories I'll have locked in my mind forever. Is I, I remember I was it was me and my girlfriend. It was this was the second night. Wesley couldn't there. make the second night, yeah. but um, I remember I was standing there in the in the crowd with my girlfriend, and then I looked to my right, and then uh, John is standing right next to me, and then I was like, "Holy shit!" I'm, <laughs> I, I I nudged my girlfriend. I'm like, "John Dwyer is standing right next to me," <laughs> and then 
But he was he was, yeah. We we're just we we're all just Vibing. loving Amplified Heat. They were incredible. It was right. a great show. Well, in a way, that's that's kind of like in shows in San Francisco. It was like every time I was at some weirdo show. I'd look over and there's John like heckling the band, like <laughs> constantly, like when shows are going on, like he's always there. He's mm-hmm. everywhere. I don't know how he does it. Yeah. But yeah. We, we should, uh, we should move over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe John will show up to one of our shows. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, one thing I noticed on a uh, castle face, uh, you know, way back in the day, I still see it nowadays. Um, castle face for the incarcerated. I, I love right. that idea. Um, how did that right. start? Uh, what, what's that process? We ripped that idea wholesale off of Ascetic House, the guys from uh, Destruction Unit. Mm-hmm. They have a record label as well. And uh, we saw that they were doing that, and that's a fantastic idea. Um, I think it works a little bit better for them because they do cassettes most of the time, mm-hmm. and uh, we don't. We haven't really done cassettes. And part of the problem I've found is that a lot of the prison facilities like refuse what you send. So we try anytime people ask, we, we do try and send stuff that'll, that'll get through. Mm -hmm. But I think they're a little bit more successful than we are at it. I mean, it's, you know, it is a nice idea and we, we do our best. Yeah. That's, I I remember seeing that too. And it was just, I was like, wow, that's a really cool idea. I had never heard of the, the other label that you were saying does it. But I remember that's a that's a great idea, and I think that's cool. Um, one thing that you touched on was that you guys don't really do cassettes. Is that was that is that like a manufacturing thing? Like you just you don't want to do it, or? Yeah, that's really me. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like, well, we'd have to get another. It, it you know, it's a whole another set 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 of steps and everything. You know, I deal with all the production, so it's like, you know. There's probably an additional 10 hours per release or 12 hours per release, you know, for CDs, which are like, you know, CDs are not very useful, but, you know, we still, (laughs) you still make them for some people still like CDs, you know, sometimes they're useful for promo, sometimes they're useful for this, but it's like, I'm just drowning in CDs. I got more CDs than I know what to do with. So Mm. I kind of assumed tapes would be sort of similar, even though they are smaller. Um, but, you know, it's like any time that you're stocking something like that, you got to have a shelf. You got to get all the boxes. You got to keep the boxes in stock. Like if they're, you know, it's, it's like sort of a sort of a thing. And two, I mean, we, we talked about uh, controversial topics, but, you know, for the longest time, Burger just made cassettes of most of our releases. So it was like, and that's sort of their thing. We'll just let them do it. Lollipop yeah. did a couple. And it was like, it was kind of easier to let other people do the cassettes. I've sort of reconsidered that recently, but I don't know. Maybe soon. I don't know. You guys really want cassettes? I A lot of people like on the OC's page and like on Facebook and Reddit and stuff, there's a lot of, and even like CD collectors, like, Every because the the talk of the town on every page is like oh, I just got this new vinyl in and stuff like that and right. but and then there's a, like a handful of people that are like well I like cassettes and I like CDs and you know right. so I mean I'm sure I it'll I mean even if it's a really limited quantity of it I'm sure people would really appreciate it and it it, it would sell I think yeah it's probably a good idea I'll give you that <laughs> I mean I've um <clears throat> back when I had uh, my tape deck. Yeah. I would actually make like bootleg, uh, design my own J cards and stuff of my favorite albums and stuff That's like bad. that. So you know, home recording is killing the music industry. So <laughs> have you guys ever seen this? Back in the day, they actually made like a little logo, and it was like a cassette with a crossbones underneath it, and like I don't know, it's it's an old school thing. But <laughs> <laughs> what was that band that uh they left the B side blank? They're like use this to record off the radio. Yeah, that's I right. I don't really remember. It was like some punk band or yeah. It, so- like it sounds like a it sounds like a Jello Biafra move or something maybe. <laughs> yeah, uh, we talked about production. You talked about production for a little bit, and that's something that we were both really interested on. Like, because yeah. especially with all the releases that you put out, you I'm sure you're swamped. You, yeah swamped <laughs> with all the releases that you get. 
and yeah. just boggling at the idea of doing one release for like ourselves like if we're like what what would be the process of that like getting in touch with like manufacturing and you know all the covers and stuff so like how does that process work right well typically you have to deal with a stack of vendors to do it because you know traditionally you'd have to have somebody to cut the lacquer and then have somebody to plate the lacquer which is usually the same thing then you have the vinyl production but you also have to deal with you know getting the print work made over here and print work here and they all come together and sometimes they don't they don't do all that stuff together so sometimes it's a little complex um working for pirates press really helped in that i sort of knew what to expect and pirates press works with gz uh, media in the Czech Republic, which is basically like its own city that does all aspects of the production. So they do the cool. cutting, the mastering, the plating, mm -hmm. the printing, the pressing, and then all the, you know, the, um, it, to some extent they do some fulfillment, you know, so it's like a lot of that stuff is sort of compiled. So you only have to deal with one set of people to deal, to deal with it. But I mean, production is like a full-time job <laughs> Like yeah. if you're doing stuff regularly. And so it's difficult to sort of like prep people for that. Cause like, I mean, part of my job was when I worked for pirates was like, all right, you guys are making your first record. That's cool. This is the one that you're going to do, but it's like trying to get people from or trying to keep people from tripping over the same hurdles that everyone trips over with, artwork with master production with expecting timelines or like you know what there's just there's kind of a lot mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so you know if you have like specific questions like i'm always happy to answer them and like people hit me up from like all over the place they're just like how do you do this how do you do that and i do try and break it down for people i mean i'm i'm still an informational resource let's say mm -hmm. yeah that's that's really cool <laughs> still a telemarketer at heart hey <laughs> <laughs> always fun. always be closing <laughs> um, yeah, you can put all right so um i haven't been collecting vinyl but i do know that from what Corey's told me and what i've seen online the whole vinyl community it seems was impacted uh, by like some resource shortage last year during 2020 because of covid is that is that accurate to say or uh, well, I can tell you, at least from my perspective in terms of dealing with GZ in the Czech Republic, uh, mm -hmm. that shipping became a problem. So that might not have affected people on the, you know, manufacturers over here in the States quite mm -hmm. so much, but for us, you know, there were weekly shipments that were coming from the Czech Republic to the Bay area. And so you could get the records shipped basically for free from one place to the other, I myself would go and pick up a bunch of records so I, to avoid shipping and stuff, which is like, you know, six hour drive. Um, so that was like a big, that was sort of a big deal when that stopped. So it, it went from all this stuff shows up like four days after it's finished to you can pay two or three dollars a unit to have this stuff shipped to you in parcels or you can put it on a boat and it'll take two or three months to get here. Mm hmm. Um, I saw actually. I, no I noticed your your uh, post on the uh, castle face on the castle face uh, fanatics. Uh, yeah, the p Facebook page. And someone asked about moon drenched. That's what yeah. happened with moon drenched. It was on a boat. Nice. <laughs> actually, it it just showed up, but it was like they said it was going to show up like a month ago. It's a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was that. Um, there was also a f more recently, uh, I think it was in December of 2020, there was a fire at one of the two production facilities that makes lacquer masters. Yeah. Jeez. It's not easy to make. Mm -hmm. uh, not all, a lot of these processes, especially with, with the vinyl, like mastering process are super specific, super like, I, I mean, it's like a chemistry problem and I never took chemistry, but like they have these like, uh, you know, really, really exacting uh, standards for how flat something has to be, you know, in order to make like a lacquer master, you're essentially making like a mirror finish of like nail polish on like an, an extremely flat machined metal disc. Mm -hmm. That then 
you know, they cut the grooves into, but then it has to also, you know, the, the lacquer itself, the, the coating that they put on it goes bad sometimes. If it's exposed to certain uh, environments, it can like, it can go, it, it, it can go bad in like a lot of different ways. And it's really delicate and you can like fuck it up just by like putting a fingerprint on it, you know? Mm-hmm. So this extra super precision detail part of the, of the vinyl process, uh, one of the two facilities burned down. The other one's in Japan. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect us very much because GZ invested in something called direct metal mastering where they cut directly into copper masters instead of the lacquer process. Basically it's like, instead of having a lacquer that you electroplate to make a a mother that you electroplate to make a father that you electroplate to make stampers, Mm -hmm. uh, the direct metal master is directly into copper and then you can make stampers directly off of it because it doesn't destroy the master. Interesting. It came out around the same time as CDs and like three people invested in it, including the Czechs and the Scientologists. <laughs> there was another, there was like another uh, facility in New York, I think that had it as well that went out of business, but the Scientologists used it to cut L. Ron Hubbard's writings into copper plates to bury him in the desert in Utah. Christ, that's Dang. crazy. <laughs> Real wild. Yeah. <laughs> so, Man. Uh, yeah, there were those problem so there was a shipping problem there's the master's problem that affected people over here and then i think you just have the same standard problems that you had before the pandemic where there are more and more large actors getting into the getting into it and so you know people like warner brothers and atlantic records and stuff can really throw their weight around and be like yeah we need this taylor swift record on time and everybody gets pushed to the side unfortunately and that's just kind of how it works mm-hmm. So I think, I think those are really the main, the main things is that it's like, yeah, there's, everyone knows that there's a, a market for vinyl now. So pretty much all this major label stuff is going into it. There's less ways to get the raw materials or to get the, to get the parts made. So turnaround times are crazy. Yeah. Hmm. Well, hopefully that all, you know, calms down a little as time goes yeah. on, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you had, you had brought up that you had kind of scouted the the questions, uh, so we'd like to get into that segment of them. We have a few yeah. that you uh, might not have seen from Instagram. I actually, cool. have one question oh, before okay. we get into Go that. Um, so you mentioned um, all these big actors, you know, like Warner Brothers, all these other people. Mm-hmm. I've noticed myself like those big labels, their records kind of suck whenever you get them. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. I got this one Tyler the Creator record. I'm like, oh, sick. Like, it's fucking cut my arm, shit like that. But, oh, no. Sharp yeah. edges, huh? Yeah, yeah. sharp edges. I'll bet, it wasn't cut I'll right. bet that was United. Yeah, United United is real bad. Also, uh, it's yeah. like their, their quality control, just, I guess, because there's so many of them and, like, they're just right. pumping them out. Like, they're just like, take it, take it. They have, uh, they have a lot of automated presses. Um, and I mean, automated presses aren't necessarily a bad thing, um, but I, you know, it's dif- it's difficult to say like what what it all is. Everyone has their like little proprietary mm-hmm. things, but mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. The, um, the there's also a lot of new people getting into the scene. Um, there's, I mean, in the past ten years, there's probably ten new vinyl manufacturing plants. There's there's a couple in yeah i saw one in portland i've seen a few in like there's one in georgia there's one in like near memphis that the fat possum guys are running i mean so a lot of people are getting into this and doing and you know starting their own thing so you know if you've been running a plant for 50 years you have a little bit 60 70 years now uh i think you know you kind of work through a lot of those problems but mm-hmm. you know it's a physical thing and it's like a it's like a craft that of that people have had to like dig through the stacks of history to like even figure out like mm-hmm. how do we properly electroplate like how do we do this how do we do that like all these technical problems haven't really been current technical problems since the 50s or 60s you know mm-hmm. so yeah um 
that's one of the reasons that I really appreciate Castle Face, like mm-hmm. what what you guys do, because every Thanks. all the like a lot of the time, um, I get records and from like other places, like different labels or you know from other resources and stuff like that, and like they're kind of somewhat hit or miss a lot of the right. times. Uh, with shipping and stuff like that but most of the time when i or all the time when i get a castle face record um it's just the little details like taking the record out of the sleeve and shipping it separately um you learn that black metal guys yeah that's that's a brilliant idea and i've seen a lot of comments talking about other labels be like you should do this like it it helps reduce seam splits and stuff like that and i i'm a i'm a man that likes collecting the uh, saving the hype stickers and you guys are starting to put them on the plastic outer sleeves which is really cool also and even even every time i open the castle face box and it says thanks for your patience and it says matt with (laughs) a little heart i'm just like oh it's so it's the personal touch that's what does it oh you know can't be perfect. Can't be Amazon. Uh, so you got to be kind of cute, I guess. <laughs> it's working. It's working. <laughs> All right. But yeah, going into the questions, um, I have a few from Instagram and then we can go ahead and do the face, some Facebook ones. Okay. Sure. Um, so this one is from, I, sorry, I always apologize for the names. We might pronounce a lot of the names wrong, but it's I'm sure personal. you'll know the questions. <laughs> uh, this is from Rory Lett. Lethbridge, uh, any advice for a growing label or for growing a label? For growing a label. Well, I mean, I think that the best advice is to tour, get the bands to tour and to, um, as much as possible, you know, if you've got two or three releases, like, try and extend it naturally. Like the bands that they're, that people are naturally playing with. Like, I think that there's a lot to be said for like your little thing, you know, like that's why you have a label. You're like, oh, I've got all these cool friends that are doing this thing. I mean, that's how our label started up. And, you know, the natural progression is, you know, you help people out with, with going on tour, if they can't, you know, try and make it work for them. I know I, I've, I've done a good bit of that. Like, you know, when we were putting out the first Once in Future Band record, and pick, you up, pick that one up. Love it. Got all their stuff. It's fantastic, <laughs> right? Yeah. And they were like, gosh, we don't know if we're going to be able to tour so much. And like, you know, I, I talked with them a bunch. You know, I think I think I bought a plane ticket or two. But like the fact of it is, is like they need to be out there playing. Yeah. They're an incredible live band. And it's like that makes it click for so many people. And, you know, they, it, I, I can't take full credit for it because, I mean, they have like incredible friends. They're like, they were opening for Tool and shit. But it's like, you know, it, it, it's like the, li- the little things about like making, making things possible so that people can get out there and spread the word about your, th- about your stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think I, th- I think really touring in like face to face contact is kind of the best way you can do it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. anything you can do to get those bands out there. Yeah. Well, you bring up Once in Future Band, and they're one of my favorite Castle Face uh, bands. They're inc- <laughs> they're they're super good. And yeah, I've I haven't seen them live before, but oh. I've seen I have seen their jam in a van, mm-hmm. and even that just blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, it's incredible. So. Those yeah. guys, I mean, they were they were like born to play like that. Like, they're, it's really, really something. Mm-hmm. So, I recommend it once they get back on the road. I think that actually they, the two of those guys, uh, Joel and Raj, are playing in Chris Robinson's new band. Oh, I think yeah, I think I've is the uh, is the Black Crows. I think it is the Black Crows. Yeah, I think so I've I seen think something like that. That's what they're doing this summer or fall. But I hope, I really hope to see them playing out again so mm-hmm. you know um the first time Corey played once in future band for me i just heard it in the background i'm like what is this like i never heard this yes song before <laughs> <laughs> when did yes. elo come out with a new album yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically and i saw like 1080p video he's like nah these guys are brand new i'm like oh shit mm-hmm. nice yeah mm-hmm. um going into the next question here um how do i gauge kills I get Gage Kells. Sorry, sorry, Gage Kells. Um, 
Uh, any info about represses for older releases or uh, pressing Red Rocks, the live performance, or um, a DVD? Any info on that? Uh, well, I don't think there's really a need for a DVD since we just put it up on YouTube. On YouTube, uh, yeah. Free media. <laughs> yeah. VHS. I, you know, people, like three people asked us about DVDs of the uh, the uh, Hounds of Foggy Notion when we reissued it. Yeah. It was like, Again, sort of like the CD conversation was like, mm-hmm. okay, are we going to spend another $2,000 on making DVDs for the like three people that really want it when you can just put all the whole, eh, you know, it's one of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, represses are constantly in the works. So I probably have five OCs represses going right now mm. of, old, of older stuff. And... I'm probably going to have to put another five in production because it's going to take five months to get them now. Um, so it's, I mean, we have 140 something releases in the catalog now. Granted, not all of them are sellouts and everything, but you know, John's got at least 30. So it's, it's rotating, you know, we do our best. Um, I try not to let, things go out of press for too long. There's a couple of things that John has said he doesn't want to repress, like uh, Quadris Bast, I think was one example, the Fortress yeah. of an Inch. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, didn't like, he didn't like how the artwork came out. Um, I think is what the issue was with that. But there's a couple of things where it's like, yeah, we probably won't redo this, but like, for the most part, like most things are either in the works or on the menu to be in the works. Cool. Um, as I, I would b- kick myself if I didn't ask, could you uh, maybe let us in on any of the OCs represses or is that all on Hush Hush right now? It's all Hush Hush, <laughs> big. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, you know. I guess we'll see when they come out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stay tuned in five months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Main Spins Records, and he asks, "Best slash least favorite part of running a label?" Uh, well, you know, it's it's pretty. Um, it's it's sort of a dream, to be fair. Like, you know, I have a great job. I get to work with interesting people. I get to play music myself. Like, I I really have no complaints. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most part, but um, I would say the worst part is just that I can't multiply myself and have more of me to do it all because I kind of do a lot by myself, mm-hmm. and it's difficult to it's difficult to find people to work with. Uh, that would be able to make make the the whole thing work better that we could afford. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. really what it comes down to. So it's like, you know, I've got all the like, you know, we want to do this, we want to do this, we want to do this. I've got all the budget sort of stuff in my head. And I'm like, you know, we're making money, but we're not making enough money to where I could pay another person to really like be another me you know mm-hmm. so that's that's sort of the problem it's like i i sort of have to scale back some of our ambitions a little bit because i realize you know i'm gonna have to do all that so mm-hmm. so, yeah. so are, do you handle like all the shipping and stuff yourself or man yeah for the, for the most part i mean i i have been working with uh strategically placed homies you know, in Australia and and in Europe and stuff to, uh, to, uh, ship some stuff so that it's, you know, gets there in better form, you know, a a hallmark of a lot of the early years was like, I shipped everything from San Francisco and like people in Norway don't get the records for four months and they show up messed up. And it's like, I guess we'll do that again. Or like, you know, so, you know, (laughs) I once had a girlfriend that was like, if you could do anything, what would it be? And I was like, I would make, I would make it so that you could teleport and I would revolutionize shipping. And she was like, I, <laughs> that's the worst answer I've ever heard. 
So, you know, uh, having to deal with, having to deal with shipping, uh, mean, you know, physical goods all around the world is, it can be trying sometimes, but Mm -hmm. you know, I, I live in a dream world. It's pretty fucking fantastic to be fair. Yeah. Well, thank you from everybody who buys from Castle Space for all your hard work and dedication. (laughs) My best. This next question, excuse me, comes from a technically, technically, sorry, Nick. Um, (laughs) Have you had any ideas for a vinyl pressing that were limited by production capabilities, as in wanting to do a specific color combination or pattern, um, but you were turned down because it wasn't possible? No, but that probably has to do with the fact that I worked in the industry for so long and know pretty intimately like what's possible. Um, I can't think of anything where I was like, oh, I really want to do this and it just like isn't going to work. So, no. (laughs) I I had like kind of a a spinoff of that. Um, Like a segue is the word. Sorry, my mind just went blank. Um, sure. a lot of the cool stuff, like I know you do layouts for a lot of the albums and stuff. And I was just always curious, like what, what does that entail? Like working with, I guess, John Dwyer to be more specific, like what is the, the layout process? Well, you know, everybody's kind of different. Um, a lot of times, and I've had a couple of these recently, people are just like, here's a stack of photos. <laughs> Um, we want to, we want to do something kind of like this and, you know, they forget the labels or this or that. And they're just kind of like, give me a stack of things. And I sort of take it from there. Mm -hmm. Uh, John is usually pretty specific. He's usually like, all right, here's the front cover. Back's going to look like this, you know, and he'll send me like little drawings and stuff. Um, Back to the technical aspect of it, actually, there's a lot of things that he's wanted to print from RGB, which if you know anything about the uh, the way that screen modes are set up, RGB and CMYK. Like yeah. CMYK is set up for print. RGB is all yeah. light. Mm-hmm. So you can make things really vibrant in RGB that you can't print. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's probably been the biggest technical thing. It's like, I want this thing to vibrate like it's like, shaking in my eyeballs and you just can't do that with regular ink yeah i i worked worked in a sign shop um so i know all about cmyk and how struggle how how much the struggle is with like ah shit they wanted a specific color but i mean it's kind of hard to you know to recreate it in irl (laughs) john's kicked stuff back and been like can you make it a hair brighter hair brighter hair bright dude cmyk man come on (laughs) yeah We've been over this. Uh, We're jumping over to the Facebook questions now, um, which I don't know if you've seen all of them, uh, but we'll go ahead and ask you anyway so they can get the response. I took a a sampler. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, This was from Matt Dye, and he asked, what is your vision for Castleface, and how much does technology influence it? Hmm. Uh, Yeah. yeah. I mean, my... My vision is sort of, you know, running after a crazy person is constantly coming up with shit. You know, John, John is a force of nature and he always has new ideas as to what, what he wants to do. So in general, like 90% of my, 90% of my uh, vision is like, let's just hope I can keep up with John, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, How much does technology play into it? Well, I'm probably gonna have to buy a new computer soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's tough to you know after after years of like throwing around music video files and everything, it's like my computer is like, please, dude, give me a break. I want to go to <laughs> I want to go to a farm in the country. <laughs> um, but you know, technology. I mean, I, I would say the only way that technology is really gonna play into into the future of castle face so much is just how easy and accessible it is for people to record themselves, which is awesome. I mean, you guys are using garage band. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, it's cool that people are able, are able to break down the walls between, you know, artist and studio and be able to take some of that into their own hands. Cause Mm -hmm. you know, 
um, a lot of times, you, you know, first take is the best take kind of thing. And so if you're there recording it yourself, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, next question comes from Charlie Baxter. It says, uh, what is the process of getting new castle faces made for each release? Uh, do you contact artists uh, and ask them, or are they submitted whenever um, whenever they draw whenever one? Whenever they draw one. If right. So, how, how many do you have ready to use at any time? Uh, well, that's kind of a multi, multi-answer multi question. I, there's a guy named Harry Wayne who made the I Like Psych pin that you got on there. He did probably half of those castle faces back there. He's done a lot for me. <laughs> um, there's a couple that I drew. There's a couple that John drew. Uh, the one with the like nose, the nose that's like kind of in between those guys. That's that's one that I did. John did the bodybuilder. Andy Warhol. That's actually from David Shrigley. He's a famous artist. <laughs> <laughs> he did the he did the artwork for the uh, Velvet Underground record. He's mm-hmm. really cool, actually. I he he reached out uh, back when I was in Blasted Canyons years ago and asked us to play his like art opening at SF MoMA, which was ludicrous. <laughs> like <laughs> this huge huge like art space. Like um, he's great. I, I basically like my general thing. Um, I. Uh, have sort of asked people when they're, if people are putting together art, I usually say, hey, like give a shot, you know, take a shot at a castle face. So a lot of them ended up that way. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the dude. There's another dude that gave me a stack of them too, that he did a couple of those. Uh, it's been a sec since I talked to him. Barris, Adam Barris uh, did a stack for me. But yeah, basically Harry Wayne got in touch and was like, hey, I'm a graphic designer in England. You know, I've got a good job. I just get really bored. And um, here's a, he, he made us a page of Castle Face temporary tattoos. I was oh, like, oh, cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and we ended up using a lot of those uh, just in general um, for, for all sorts of releases. So, you know, um, people have submitted them. I saw one thing on Facebook where a girl like posted, she's like, Oh, I, I drew some castle faces. What do you guys think? And I was like, Oh man, I like that one. She was like, I, that. I was like, all right, that's cool. So I, I plan on using that one. You know, I just sort of keep, I keep a little folder of them, you know? And like mm-hmm. when I'm looking at the layout for records, I kind of try and think, Oh, what, what's going to look good. What, what kind of thematically flows with the rest of the release. Sometimes they're really on the nose, but like, Hey, whatever. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. That's another thing I was gonna ask is like, if do you kind of theme them with like the certain albums and stuff? But that, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, definitely. And you know, there's been a couple of instances where I was just like, oh, I don't have anything, so I may come up with them. Like this, the one below the pyramid right there is one that I drew for a floating coffin. That guy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's like I was I was working on the layout and I looked through the castle faces I had and I was like, man, none of these really work. How about it's just like this, and I just drew it. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, this next one is from Chris, which I'm sure you know from the. And he's asking, uh, "When am I getting my fucking pay raise?" <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, this is this is the great part of working with people. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. We'll see. We'll see, man. Let's see how Q4 goes, all right? <laughs> <laughs> are you down? Um, are you guys ever going to start accepting physical demos again? We always have. Oh. Mm, okay. The page is still on our site. It just says make them good, which... Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the only rule. People are always like, where can I send demos? Where can I do this? Where can I do that? And it's like, it's on the site got our PO box. Like just send them. Hmm. Just make and, sure John shows up to your show and <laughs> <laughs> likes you. Yeah. Well, and you know, the thing is we get a lot of demos and a lot of people just don't seem to know really what we're doing. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's sort of part and parcel with the with the modern landscape, the post MySpace digital band landscape is like if a record label accepts demos, it's just like wall to wall. And, you know, I, re- I really try and listen to a lot of them. 
Um, people email them to me all the time, you know. So I listen to a lot of them, but there's only one of me. There's only one of John. We have a limited amount of resources and, you know, there's, there's only so much that we can do. So it's, it's truly flattering that people, people want to be a part of the thing, but I think the better way to really doing it, I mean, besides just like, you know, putting an envelope full of money in our PO box (laughs) is is to, uh, you know, get out there and tour, you know, play around. Like it's, it, I, I think, to me, it's much more impressive to see when people have made their own connections and people do their thing where they are. And, you know, they're not, everybody's not all trying to like, all right, I'm going to move to LA and then like, I'm going to get on the label and like, that's it. We're fucking set. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. it's so much better if you're like, oh yeah, no, we play, we play with our friends' bands. We go to Seattle, we play with our friends up there. You know, we have friends out in, in Texas. We go and play in Texas. We do this, we do that. Like, I think that that's, that's sort of the more mature way to, to do it. It's like you kind of make what you want for yourself and people notice or they don't, you know? Mm-hmm. Has there been like any standouts of people that send in demos that you're like, hmm, I should, I should see if I could get in touch with them. Like how would that process work? If, if, yeah. if there's one that you like. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, the one band I can think of that sent us demos that actually became a record is prettiest eyes. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And those guys are fantastic, mm-hmm. incredible work ethic. And they were playing gobs of shows and they were doing their own thing. I mean, I remember the demo when they, when, when John eventually was like, we got to put this band out. And I was like, awesome. They're going to be very pleased because they wrote to me incessantly. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it wasn't like they were just sitting on it and waiting for it. They were going out in there and getting, you know, yeah. and they're, they're very much those kind of guys like that, that, that band is so cool. And yeah. Patchy Man, have you heard Patchy's yeah, Patchy's his, love yeah. project? Mm-hmm. So good. He just yeah. it, it, they just uh, he just signed with uh, ATO to put out their new I record. I saw that. I'm, I'm going to buy it. Yeah, I'm going to buy their press. I, I already bought it. I was, I'm very <laughs> proud of it. So. Yeah, that's it was, it's really cool. Um, I've seen Prettiest Eyes twice, and both of them. It, one of them was at that Levitation show in 2019. And then the other one was when 20, maybe late 2019 also when they played at uh, Hotel Vegas a few nights yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And I saw them there also. Incredible live performers also. Yeah. They were on tour literally when the pandemic shut everything down. They were like in France trying to play shows. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it speaks to their hustle. Like they, they were out there doing the thing. So, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, one last thing that I wanted to bring up before we kind of wrap it up is sure. um, I, I know you guys do like represses of like older albums and stuff mm-hmm. like that that aren't like of artists that aren't necessarily on your label and stuff like um, the Mikey Young album or the mm-hmm. Mickey Young one was uh, incredible. I bought that one. I, I didn't even know. I hadn't heard of them uh, before then. I haven't Rock heard of that album. Bitches, man. Yeah, and then I picked it up. I was like, I'm really glad I did this. Um, yeah. So, so like, how do you go about finding older records and being able to press them your, yourself? Mikey is a is a different sort of thing because he's in total control, and um, we did, you know, we did the OC split with them. We've been we've been tight with those guys for a long time. Mm-hmm. So Mikey is sort of in the family. He, it, you might have noticed, did you if you caught Bridget's record? He oh produced yeah, yep. a third of that. He's done mastering for a bunch of stuff. He's sort of like a linchpin dude down in Melbourne. So like, um, but I mean, again, it's like, it really comes back to John. Like, you know, he's like, we really should reissue this Swiss psych band, you know, the uh, uh, Kedama. Kedama, yeah. That's the one yeah. I, I was going to bring up. It's three LPs, you know, only one of them's never been released before, but they came out, you know, so long ago, or this one came out on CD. And like, he's, he's really into, again, he's just voracious. So he's like always, you know, he's always looking for stuff and he's always like throwing ideas at the wall. Like there's, 
I mean, for all the reissues things that we've done, there's probably twice as many that we haven't done that we tried to do. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you have to you have to ask the maestro about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, there's, actually, something else I wanted to okay, uh, go for it. I guess ask sure. or bring up. Uh, would you ever do like a little flight or sorry, sorry, castle face like little catalog thing? Because um. <clears throat> I was looking through my my old stuff, uh, you know, memoirs and things like that, and I noticed like a little booklet. It said Castle Face Records, and it had like you know, oh, this record coming out. I really love when labels do stuff like that. It reminds me of uh, old records, like you know, you pick out a Beatles record, and then the sleeve is like an ad for, oh, we also have these bands. Yeah. Would you do more of that stuff, or I can do more of that stuff. Yeah, that's completely within my possible within my realm of. Uh, Within my wheelhouse, yeah, I'll do, I'll totally do more. That'd nice. be really cool. Was Let's that see. with Smote that that came think, out with? I think it was. Yeah, uh, it was like a CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll do more of those. Those there, are really cool. Maybe uh, it's kind of like it, it helped to to uh, coincide it with the big OCs release. Yeah, that's so, how that's well, how we found out about like the Hounds of Foggy Notion and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. really yeah. cool stuff. Maybe a thick as a brick kind of. Uh, a whole newspaper in the record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely all possible. It's, it's, you know, it, it takes a little bit of work to do those things, but, um, also too, you know, now with things so far out, it's like, I guess I have a lot more time to anticipate. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, we were, we were sort of like planning things like six months out, like, all right, Basically, once you guys give me the art and the master, the record can come out roughly six months from there. Now it's like roughly a year from there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the yeah. farther in the future that you go, the easier it is actually to do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, I remember the hype was real when everybody was getting those little things and they're like, "Holy shit, they're repressing all this stuff." <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Well, it was in a self-addressed stamped envelope too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the more that we can get into like back of comic book page, like advertisements, like, yeah, I think I'll probably do more of that. That'd be really cool. Cool. Um, all right, man. Well, it was so cool talking to you. Yeah. Uh, hey, you, you were a great time. Um, and again, uh, thank you so much for all the work that you do. Cause I am sure it's not easy, but you do it. You do it for us and we love it. We love you for it. <laughs> Do it for the scene, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, have a great rest of your day and stay safe and stay clean out there. All right, man. See you See guys. Ya. Talk with you later.